Excellent. Thank you, Aperva. And welcome, everybody. It is great to have you all here today for another edition of Office Hours. Uh, I am Zoe from the Rebus community. And as always, we are pleased to be partnering with Karen from OTN and the other folks at OTN, there are many more of them, um, to bring you our Office Hours uh, session. Oh, good. I like the, I like the responses to the, to the officialness of our recording today. Um, so we are joined, as always, by some fantastic guests who are going to be talking to us about tenure and promotion and OER, how they intersect and some of the experiences they've had with these questions, um, which is, we think is going to be a great discussion. And in particular, we're excited about this as a kind of continuation of a theme that emerged semi-deliberately, I would say, over the past few months in these sessions as we're talking about incentives uh, and, and how to kind of really recognize the work that goes into uh, creating and, and maintaining OER and using them um, and, and acknowledging that it's, it's very important to, to make that work known and reward it in all sorts of different ways. Um, and so I think that's very relevant to, to where we're headed with today's discussion. Uh, so I will now hand over to Karen, who will introduce our guests and we'll get rolling. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Zoe. Indeed, I'm Karen Lauritsen with the Open Textbook Network and delighted to be here with the Remus community during our monthly office hours. As a reminder, these sessions are community driven. So if you have topics that you would like to explore in the future, please do let us know. And as Zoe said, today we're gonna to talk about tenure and promotion in OER and discuss if and how faculty engagement with OER can be impacted, incentivized by tenure and promotion policies. So we have three guests who are joining us today. Our guests will talk for about five minutes and then we will look to all of you for your questions and comments and to drive the conversation. Um, we will hear from Mark Pepsil, who's associate professor at the Department of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. Then we'll hear from Jackie Stewart, who's senior instructor with the Department of Chemistry and Deputy, Deputy Academic Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And finally, we will hear from Jonathan Poritz, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Mathematics and Physics, as well as Director and Data Analyst with the Center for Teaching and Learning at Colorado State University Pueblo. So I will now turn things over to Mark to get us started. Okay. Um... Thank you for calling me associate professor. It always feels good to hear that. Having just earned tenure over the, like officially at the end of uh, the last academic year is very exciting. Um, I think that my story starts with working on one chapter for an uh, OER textbook called Media Innovation and Entrepreneurship uh, with um, Michelle Ferrier and with Mays. And um, what really mattered for my particular department's approach to tenure was that there was a peer review process before this was published. Um, I think the most interesting perhaps caveat of this was at my college level, my research was ranked uh, at a higher degree at a higher level. Like we have, we have three levels like excellent and satisfactory and unsatisfactory and my college uh, colleagues wanted to call my research excellent and my department was like, no, no, just satisfactory. To which I said, whatever, I'm still getting tenure, whatever. All right, so that, that's kind of the big, you're gonna take a headline away from this, whatever, I got tenure. Um, but what I think was convincing to people in a broader sense was that this is a really collaborative uh, uh, peer review process. We had uh, editors review the chapter, we had blind peer review look at the chapter, and then we uh, opened this up to uh, basically create a community of practice where we each sort of picked apart each other's chapters and made suggestions for practical use, but also for updating whatever theoretical uh, material was included. And, um, you know, in a sense, these are sort of on the, in the sort of academic world, like literature reviews, or it's, it's, I think it's something more than quote unquote, just a textbook or just a textbook chapter, because you have to be on the cutting edge. You're basically bringing brand new literature uh, as recent as possible to students. And then the final aspect of peer review was everybody who reads the book has the opportunity to open up a little tray on the right side and comment and tell you about your mess ups, your typos or what's missing. Um, and that's most, I think that's the most constructive feedback is what would they like to see in the next version, right? And so 
I had great experience with that process, being part of a community of scholars and uh, scholar teachers uh, talking about media uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And then I said, you know, I have written this other textbook that was on uh, an Apple platform and I would sure like for this massive text to count for something. Can you basically get it peer reviewed for me? And the answer was yes. And we can do it relatively quickly uh, with a lot of enthusiasm and with very helpful editors. And I was very grateful for that. Um, and I think it was taken by my college colleagues as a, a great effort to really contribute to a new way of approaching textbook authoring that, that was valuable from an academic, uh, not just a pedagogical standpoint, but from a maybe more academic research literature review type uh, approach. Then my colleagues who seem to be like, it's not an academic book, it's not a chapter, but we'll, we'll give you some credit as it was peer reviewed. So I think that's been my five minutes more or less, but it counted. Can't say how it will count for everyone else's department. I can say it took a lot of uh, explaining in detail in a narrative what people did to peer review me that this should count as peer review. Um, but there are plenty of people in my field, especially at a master's granting institution who get lit reviews published or more sort of broad theory based. They're, not, they're all doing experiments and surveys and you know, uh, quantitative social science. And so I'm, I'm basically saying, this is, look, this is a social science contribution as a literature review. It just happens we're bringing this into the classroom and teaching it now because it's so needed. Now, thank you very much. Please give me tenure. And they did. Congratulations, Mark, and thank you. I'll now hand things over to Jackie. Okay, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, as was mentioned, I'm at the University of British Columbia, which is a fairly large public research intensive university in Canada. And we have two tenure, stra tenure track streams. One is the typical research professorial track and the other we call the educational leadership stream. Um, the educational leadership stream is assessed on teaching excellence, educational leadership and service. And then of course the research side is research teaching and service. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of the background for how OPEN has become uh, more prominent and recognized, uh, particularly as a form of educational leadership. It doesn't mean that research faculty aren't encouraged to do it, um, but there it would fall more under uh, teaching excellence if uh, research professors were to spend time on developing or using um, or adapting OPEN resources. Um, so that's kind of how things work up here. We also have, of course, non tenure track faculty uh, as lecturers and sessional instructors, which are sort of like adjuncts. And the big kind of takeaway for what we call as educational leadership is something that has impact beyond your own classroom. So this could be the scholarship of teaching and learning, uh, wide scale curriculum development efforts that, you know, take some leadership role. Uh, developing resources. Um, there's a huge list of things actually that so-called count. And uh, about five years ago, there wasn't really anything that um, explicitly mentioned open education resources in our policies or documentation, but you can clearly see how OERs would fit into that impact part because if other people are adopting what you're using, um, that's evidence that you're um, having a reach beyond your own class. In 2014, our institution developed a policy on the use of teaching materials that was pretty focused on um, whether or not faculty members had to give explicit permission to have others use the resources they created with UBC time. Um, and in that policy, it was definitely stated that uh, instructors were encouraged to um, use Creative Commons licenses or digital repositories or other open access channels to distribute the materials uh, broadly. But this wasn't really enforced. It was just kind of in there as like, we encourage this. It's, you know, a good thing to do. I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so it was kind of mentioned as we support this is a good thing to do, but um, not official. In our uh, recent collective agreement, um, we do have a little bit in there, but the collective agreement that we have as faculty members between us and the institution, again, doesn't explicitly mention um, open. It does say including publications such as textbooks, print and electronic publications, book chapters, articles, um, instruction manuals, other resources. So resources are in there as something that people can work on and receive um, sort of educational leadership credit for doing that. 
But the most exciting part really um, happened in 2016, or leading up to 2016, when um, some students really got motivated to help faculty get recognized for engaging in OERs. And um, along with our collective agreement, there's something that is a really important on campus called our Senior Appointments Committee Guide. And that's really a fleshed out version of the tenure and promotion requirements and what all these things mean. So it's in a lot more detail than the collective agreement. And so our group of students who were interested in this met with the chair of the Senior Appointments Committee and offered some wording suggestion for getting open explicitly into that SAT guide, we call it. Um, so it's in there now um, since 2016. And what it says is con contributions to the practice and theory of teaching and learning literature, including publications in peer reviewed and professional journals, conference publications, book chapters, textbooks, and open education repositories slash resources. So it just took a little, you know, tiny wording change to put it in there, but it definitely fit with the rest of uh, what was in that section. Um, so then, since then, things have really started moving, I would say, at my institution. Um, in our inclusion category of our 2018 strategic plan, um, open is really highlighted in, in that plan. Um, so it says UBC is expanding the use of open textbooks to improve affordability. And later in that section talks about uh, UBC being committed to making education more affordable and accessible with expanded creation and dissemination of OERs. So it's in there, it's in the strategic plan. Maybe that was you know, caused by more interest on campus. I think that certainly could be true. And uh, now what's, what's happening currently? So we have the policy, the SAT guide, now it's in our strategic plan. Um, and we have, I would say, more dedicated resources because of this. So this fall, um, due in a couple of weeks, actually, we have um, an OER fund that has been created as a way to implement that aspect of the strategic plan. Um, we've also had some OER, um, you know, emphasis in one of our large teaching and learning enhancement funds. So that's there as well. Um, and then I'll kind of just wrap up with some of the impact. So this hasn't been something that has been tracked quantitatively in terms of whether these things have gotten more faculty members interested in using or creating OERs. Um, but I talked to Will Engel, who's our strategist at the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology for Open Education Initiatives. Um, and he thinks the conversation really has changed a few years ago. Um, he reports that faculty members might be, you know, worried, like, is doing this good? Is it good for the university? Is it something that they think I should be spending my time on? Um, how will this, um, you know, count towards my scholarly educational activities? And so those conversations have definitely shifted and, you know, just become more nuanced in terms of figuring out different ways to do it, what the licensing requirements might do, um, how to write about these things in one's tenure and promotion package. Um, so I think for all of these things, we're really making headway to overcome some of these barriers um, to adopting and making new OERs, which is that lack of professional recognition. I think that's really going away. And um, yeah, so it's nice to see our university supporting this with the strategic plan and some funding. And we're kind of riding a wave right now, I see it as. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Jackie. And it's great to see some questions coming up in the chat. We will turn to those shortly after we hear from Jonathan. Hi, okay, so let me um, do um, past, present, and future on my institution. So I'm at, um, I'm at a four-year regional comprehensive a public institution in Southern Colorado. The, um, I think the statistics are that the majority of students in higher education in the United States are actually in community colleges, uh, but among four-year institutions in the United States, the majority of students are at four-year regional comprehensive institutions. So it's the, like, like the one I'm at. Um, so anyway, I got into, let me tell you my personal experience. So I got tenure in 2012, um, and I, that was the first year that I had started using um, OER in my own classrooms. I actually had sort of open ed practice. I had a student written textbook that we were building in a advanced course in our major. So obviously it didn't impact the, my tenure process at all. Um, the, I would say the things that I just want to put under, underline the things I was thinking about to get tenure. So on my campus, you had to have one research publication to get tenure. 
and you had to have, but the things that I thought about, so I, I had lots of recent publications, that wasn't my concern. The things that I thought about at the time I was here, tenure track was I didn't want to spectacularly screw up any of my classes. I didn't want to piss off any of the senior members of my department, and I wanted to do sort of visible service in the department and around my campus. Those were the three things I thought I had to do um, to get tenure, and it worked, I got tenure. Um, that, so then, so sort of the, for the present maybe is sort of, so I'm an associate professor, in theory I could apply to be promoted. So promotion is the second part of promotion and ten, tenure and promotion. And um, there is no numerical requirement on my campus for a number of publications. There's some sort of generic thing about um, significant continuing contributions to the campus and the discipline. Um, I think I do both of those things, but I also think I have no chance of ever getting promoted because I, I have, since I got tenure, I stopped being so careful about not pissing off the senior members of my department. So um, I would say it's a very, the, this is a thing that people maybe who are not living this experience don't realize how kind of the formalities are um, in some sense merely formal. You know, I mean, there are places where you could, you could have a requirement for one publication and, you know, a little note you wrote on the bathroom stall could count as a publication if you're, if the people in your department like you. Um, uh, if they don't like you, you could have a you know great publications in other uh, other um, in great journals. So that's kind of a um, a, a conflict. So then, in terms of the future, so we have more activity um, on my campus in OER, and so there has been a lot of discussion. Oh, everyone says that it should be valuable to get a, some formal recognition of OER in PNT. So I'm working with the chair of our the president of our faculty senate to have a proposal. The thing is, these things on institutions, I don't know if we're just a particularly inept institution or this is typical of my kind of institution, it takes forever to get a change like this made. You know, it's like it goes through first readings and second readings and committees and the, the committee changes in the middle of, you know, in the middle of this process and a whole new committee needs to revisit everything. So it's taking, you know, just an absolutely unimaginably slow pace to get anywhere. The proposal is to make a specific line item on I think the research, recognition as a research, so the, the three famous pillars, service, scholarship, and pedagogy, and putting it in the scholarship category of an of, you know, OER publication or some sort of OER entity. Um, and I think, um, I think that's gonna hit, a, on my campus, it's gonna hit a big barrier because there's a feeling that, you know, why should it be scholarship? It's not, you know, so Mark gave a good example, you know, a good case for it being uh, related to scholarship as it related to lit reviews. but I think the more hard ass the faculty wants to be about, you know, this is not, this is, you know, this is pedagogy. It's not really advancing the scholarship of, of my discipline as much. So um, I think it's going to be very hard for us to get that realized. And I, I, let me, um, let me end with a provocation. I, I don't know that formal policies on PNT would make any difference on an inst in a campus like mine. I think, or I actually, I, I would argue maybe in other, lots of institutions, I think at R1s, you know, you're never going to get recognition of an OER as scholarship because it's not advancing the, 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 the cutting edge of your discipline. Pedagogy, you could recognize it, but, you know, people, pedagogy counts much less at the R1s than it does at other institutions. On a campus like mine, you know, it's just, it's the people who you want to convince are already convinced. They, they care about teaching the students and they're already on board. So I, I, would, I would argue that the crucial thing that we advancing the, the agenda of OER through formal policy, I mean that that the major thing is culture. We need to change the culture that, that it should be part of something that you always reach to, and um, I think actually Jackie made an interesting case for kind of some policies do have a culture change the culture slowly. So um, I suppose I could be convinced that putting it in PNT would help change the culture. But I think the goal is changing the culture. What is in the policy would have very have had li very little impact on my life and on the lives of people I see who are on the tenure track now. And one final comment here, I think it's important, at least in the United States, um, 75, I I've seen the number, more than 75% of contact hours um, that students in higher ed have is not with a tenure line faculty member. So it's kind of, you know, it's a, are we aiming, are we hitting the biggest target here by going after PNT? If, if the people who are in the classrooms where the students are not tenure line, then we can have whatever policy we want on PNT and it's not really going to, you know, maybe we should working on OER making the lives of adjuncts better would be a more, a more of, I don't know. Anyway, that's just my last uh, provocation. Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks to our three guests for their perspectives. 
and ending with those provocations. So Jonathan has put questions to this entire group. Um, and Jackie and Mark, um, of course, feel free to chime in too to Jonathan's questions. And there's been a lot going on in the chat, so I'm going to try and catch up. Um, but please, if you have a question and you prefer to unmute and be more conversational, you are invited to do that. Um, so let's see, I think Jackie, the first question we have note of is for you and the student leaders. Were they graduate students, undergrads, or, or who was leading the charge? Yeah, great question. My understanding is that they were undergraduate students who were um, part of the executive of our student society, the Alma Mater Society. And uh, that society has been very supportive of OER and recently has been working with our center to create um, an open education award. This year they had an event for, um, what were we called? Open Oh, I totally forget what it was called, but um, people who were involved in open, they had an event that recognized them and um, said how important this is to students. So again, it was mostly undergraduates at that uh, student society who have been leading the way. Nice, great. Mm -hmm. And Mark, this question is for you from Colby. You mentioned different types, typos, broader content of peer review. How were those different types of peer reviews perceived by your institution? Does peer review need to be by peers from your own discipline to be perceived as legitimate? I think you responded in the chat, but if you could also share your thoughts with us. In short, yes. It, to be counted as peer review toward tenure, I needed to have other people, preferably at um, at, at, at least, a, you know, if not at a research one university in the United States, at least at a master's granting or some, someplace that conducts research, uh, review my text. So I had to make the case that um, the editors of the textbook were uh, research professors or even dean, dean level folks, and that uh, the, you know, I had a letter from Michelle that explained who my blind peer reviewers were and their feedback that they gave. I think the public feedback is just um, something that helps make the case for the value to students and for the value to the broader community. I mean, um, part of it is having peer review and then part of it is measuring the impact. and on the impact side, it, it, you're not going to get little, you know, parenthetical citations and academic articles for your textbook, but you can demonstrate that this has had a real uh, impact on, on teaching and on, on the teaching of the theory, which is why I, again, I have the sort of, I don't want to call it a luxury, but I, I can keep going back to, I'm at a <clears throat> master's granting sort of teaching oriented institution. So if I'm bringing theory to teaching, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I'm meant to do. And so that's a long answer to a simple question, which is it still needed to be peer reviewed. I still needed to document that. But in terms of impact, I think uh, it could make the case that I was uh, in, in amending the text, listening to what the public was saying. Nobody really cares about the grammar and typos, uh, but it, it did show a, you know, I could make the case that this was a totally comprehensive review process. Some people care about grammar and typos. They're out I, there. I have an English degree and a journal. <laughs> and I used to go head to head with the editor of the college paper about grammar. I, I really appreciate the importance of it. <laughs> right. Um, and, and this connects actually to something Anita said. Uh, I think Mark, you just said you did have to document the peer review process. Is there any visible place where that documentation may live that you could share with others? Um, I, don't, I don't have it in the book itself, right? Was that the question? Do I, did I put it? <laughs> In the book, or you know, in a in a document, or at a link. Um, I don't. I would have to. You're asking for. Um, what, Anita, what? feel free. Feel sure. free to chime in, but I think. So go ahead. I, people who might be interested in adopting your book or are reviewing it um, may be swayed uh, positively <laughs> by knowing what type of review it went through. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, Aperva might be able to chime in, but there's there's some reference to that, like somewhere in like the sort of like, uh, you know, sort of yes. materials and stuff, but but I, I didn't do that. So I, I was kind of lucky I didn't have to generate that. She did just uh, post a link in the chat with, 
that has about the review statement that the book went through. So thank, thank you, you. No worries. And I'll add that in addition to this, I think for Mark's tenure dossier, we also put together a little letter that sort of outlines this process again in a little more detail. So on, you know, Rebus letterhead or whatever it was. So we gave that to him to include in the file as well. Oh, yeah, I, I so it was pretty much the same information in both places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't write that into a chapter. And so I, I, once I got tenure, I put a lot of that out of my mind. <laughs> Thank you, Aprova. Um, speaking of links and resources, Jackie, uh, do you have the link to the collective agreement? Have you already posted that? I haven't. Do you want me to post it now? Sure, and that'd be great. I'll do that and the SAC guide. Um, there's also um, a document kind of story about that student involvement piece that I'll post too. Thank you. Let's see, Amy Hoffer has a question for any and all of our three guests. Do you have experience with top-down institution-wide changes versus changing guidelines one department at a time? I guess I can speak to that first if you want. I think our um, approach or what has happened at UBC is kind of grassroots. People start to hear about OER and uh, start valuing it and being involved. Um, but I think for us, that top-down policy was important um, just to say it counted. Um, because our culture here is really, if it, it's not going to, if we're not sure it's going to count, then it won't count. Um, that's kind of, I think, where people err more on the side of. And I think that wasn't necessarily true if people wanted to put a lot of effort into explaining what this was and how it worked in their tenure package that may be successful. But of course, when you go up for tenure, there's that element of fear and not knowing if something will count or not. So I think that uh, policy was really important. Um, yeah, so I think, and it has led to that culture cha change, like I think, was Mark talking about that? Um, in terms of it raising the status of that activity has definitely happened since then. So I'm the president of my faculty union and we're currently going through, with regard to workload, operating papers changes across the entire campus. We just kind of ratified our first contract over the past summer. And then the, I was the vice president of my union and the president got pneumonia and she just quit. And so <clears throat> now I'm president and I'm worried actually that we don't have it formalized where to put open educational resources and where they're going to count. <clears throat> I think that most P, uh, P and T is left out of the, the contract and for sort of departments and other units to figure out. Um, but I also know that the initiative has come from our own provost that we should have something um, sort of in the vein of um, the educational leadership stream that you talked about. Um, I don't think, I don't know what we would call it, but we would basically call it you know, tenured as a teacher kind of thing. Um, and that, you know, we would, as a union, we would really support that because uh, different paths work. The more paths you have to tenure, probably the better for people, um, especially in, in these fields like, I mean, I'm in mass media where um, the technological changes and the research uh, changes so rapidly, it, it's often outdated by the time you publish an article, even if you're on top of, <clears throat> you know, changing in the journalism industry, journalism media studies, to publish something that was brand new in 2016 that really kind of smells outdated in 2019. And so um, open is, a, is a, sometimes a better way to, to move um, the research and the pedagogy together on parallel tracks rapidly. So we'll make that case. Um, but my, my future thinking is, how can I do that as a, as a union leader? I mean, just to uh, my perspective, although I think that that there's a, I mean, the, the thing, the phrase that we, I don't think we've said out loud yet is academic freedom, right? And so um, it seems like these policies, uh, departments very jealously and faculty very jealously guard their idea of academic freedom. And part of the idea of academic freedom is disciplinary expertise, right? So in a certain sense, it's, if you believe in academic freedom, and if you believe in that's the, ju the justification of it, then you have to leave all these things to the individual departments to set their own priorities. And you know, like what Mark was just saying about workload, we, we've even had different, you know, different disciplines want to have different workload policies. And we, my, my campus has colleges and then departments within colleges. And they tried to have even college level workload policies. The provost would really love to have that. And there's a huge amount of pushback about, you know, it's different to be a bench scientist in a, phys in a physical science than it is to be a social scientist or a humanities professor or, or many other disciplines. So I think that that's, 
And I, I don't, I would say I don't, I don't have any trouble with academic freedom being important. But there's a, um, and so I think it's very hard to, it's hard to drive it um, from the top down without, you know, trampling on, I think, a fundamental thing that makes universities good, so. Thank you all. So we're talking a lot. Can I try to about... say one, one oh, more? Yeah. Sure. A, a lot of this, and if we're talking about top down or bottom up, it might actually come from outside of your institution. The state of Illinois wants to encourage open educational resources. Like, I'm not sure if it fits into this conversation, but my university said, hey, Mark, we know you do this OER crap. Can you serve on a statewide committee about OER? And I said, well, I guess I have to because I'm like the biggest name on campus about this. I'm a big proponent. And I, you don't make a huge case in your tenure packet about caring about OER and not expect there to be some punishment. <laughs> and so in my case, I have some ability to influence policy at the state level, but um, the state of Illinois is going to do it because they can make the case that they're watching out for students' budgets, right? And watching out for the, the people. And, um, and I wholeheartedly support making information available where possible, where, where feasible for, for broader audiences. And I think that's one of the main points of being involved in the movement. Um, but just about everybody you talk to who's really invested in OER talks about, you know, students first and, and reaching public uh, on a consistent basis. Uh, but it may come from, it may come from even outside of your institution. And Jackie clarified in the chat that, you know, none of the UBC policies mandate using OER. And I don't think anyone, I think there are a few stories already out there about how that can be a problem, um, but they recognize creating, using, and sharing it as educational leadership. Do you want to add to that comment? Um, not really. I think um, there are kind of separate discussions about uh, resources that cost students money that are used for assessment that are happening kind of in parallel, and should we have caps on that, and what are the guidelines around that, um, which are also good, um, but I think it's good that it's kind of happening separately. Um, yeah, just because it's a, OERs are growing, there might not be appropriate resources for all disciplines. So yeah, it's mainly just that it counts for something, whether you're on the research side and that's more teaching excellence or the educational leadership side, and then it's a sign of that leadership. Mm -hmm. I just jump in for a second then. I think I think the, the temptation for mandates, I mean, I think it's great that Jackie pointed out that it's not mandatory from for UBC, but, the temptation for met for putting a mandate is so overwhelming i think to some people who have these kinds of powers like about a year ago i gave a presentation to the colorado commission on higher education which is an oversight board in the state government of all public public higher ed and most people had never heard of over open education before i walked into the room but i gave a kick-ass presentation and as i was walking out one of the commissioners sort of grabbed my shoulder and he said you know why don't we just require this for all of all of public higher ed in the state of colorado and you know, you convinced me. It's like I, that was not what I wanted to convince you of. And um, I think it just—it's awfully tempting to people, you know. And I almost see why they would say that, right? But it's—I I think we all in this community know it's a bad idea. Okay, I just wanted to pause in case uh, any anyone else wanted to chime in on that on that note. Um, the next question we have here is from Sherry Jones, who um, mentioned all of the good points about changing the culture to change perspectives on OER. And she asks, what are publishing articles, what about publishing articles in OA journals, would OA articles be considered advancing discipline scholarship? So again, I think I you know, just jump in. I, I I'm not at a research-heavy institution, but I was educated at R ones, and um, and I know people who are still in that world. And um, it seems like there there you know this whole idea of impact factor being um, the a measurement of the quality of a journal is this numerical thing. And I I I think that most places that are research-heavy have a little more nuanced view of that. So open access journals. Um, you know, like plus science, what's it? Plus science, plus one, uh, public library of science there. Some of those journals are some of the most widely read and there are studies that the impact of publishing in the open, in open access journals uh, is much greater than publishing closed, closed journals. So you know, in my discipline, if I had an article in the annals of mathematics, that would be really amazing. If I had an, an article in an open access journal, it wouldn't instantly, people wouldn't instantly say, oh my God, that's amazing, but they would, they would recognize it fully well. So I don't think there's really a problem um, 
I don't think it's a negative view of open access journals. And I, I think since the journal, I think the, the, the journals world is changing so quickly, um, as, as I'm sure we're all aware that I think that in a, another few years, people will stop even wondering about this, that we ever, that we ever gave all of our firstborn children to Elsevier and, and Taylor Francis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I'll add a, a little note to that. I think too, that journals retain a lot of the kind of the prestige and the structures of traditional, of, of closed journal publishing in a way that uh, open educational publishing doesn't tend to, or at least not as clearly. So I think that's why there's the emphasis on, on peer review with OER as being the, the marker of it, because OA journals are still peer reviewed. They still have an acceptance. Uh, you know, process. They still have the editorial boards, whereas I think it's it's less directly parallel in, in those kinds of structures when we're talking about open educational resources um, being published. And so I think that makes the journal case a little easier to make. Um, but I think that's something for us all to take on in the OER community to think about how we can help line up those things like, you know, what came up before about, okay, understanding what kind of peer review happened on this text. Can we, you know, without limiting and, and reproducing the same um, kinds of systems that have existed, can we offer some structures, some indicators, something that help translate it into terms that, uh, you know, folks can be familiar with who have more experience with traditional publishing approaches? One of my main academic, like purely academic publications is in an OA journal. And what I recall from having to describe in my narrative was not, you know, how the peer review process worked. Um, but I also put in to that narrative, um, who else publishes there, and that these are some of the most cited people in my field. So like, you know, I, I'm, I'm head and shoulders with these other people who you might have heard of, or if you hadn't, you can Google them while you're eating my tenure packet and see that they're for real. Um, was the main case that I had to make was this was not a pay to play journal, because there had been some problem elsewhere in the college, not in my department with somebody trying to get, you know, a couple articles that, that were essentially in kind of and well, they were quite questionable journals. Um, and so I just had to make the case for why this type of OA wasn't that. And I think that would become less incumbent upon us as kind of as people get more used to it and publish more in OA. Going back to um, the conversation earlier, I think Jonathan, you made the point about adjunct and part-time faculty uh, doing a lot of this work, and maybe there's something there uh, to consider. So Amy Hoffer and Sherry Jones um, have some questions about that. So Amy says, default adoptions, especially for high enrollment courses, something I think about regarding this issue. However, that it is not related towards tenure promotion or moving from part-time to full-time positions for those faculty members. Is there a PNT angle on improving work stability for that particular faculty population? Amy, I don't know if you want to say any more or chime in with any details um, for that question, but Sherry added, um, actually I'll wait on what Sherry added because I think it's kind of a separate, separate angle on this question. Wait, did, didn't she modify her comment and say that it was in fact not a PNT angle, but an OER angle on on making things more stable for? Oh, did she? Um, because I think I you know PNT is kind of a lot, you know, for contingent labor. That's a whole huge ball of wax. It's a horrible thing happening in education right now, and that's a, a that's a separate question. But I don't think PNT does not is not a way that 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 we can offer support to our faculty colleagues who are in that status. But I think OER is a way we can offer support. I mean, you know, to, you know, the road warrior who goes from to several different campuses, I think if they use, you know, Cengage Unlimited on one campus and a Pearson offering on another campus, you know, their, their lives are much more complicated. If, if they're all using open stacks, or even if one of them is using open stacks, but one of, one of them is using some other resource from some other repository, they, they it's, it's open, they can get, they can get it more quickly, they can make any modification, they could make modifications in some local version that bring their work more into line on different campuses. Um, I think it's, I think it, it, you know, just the same argument that works the, the sort of quality of the resource and, and the ability to control your pedagogy if that OER provides to tenure line faculty applies equally well to adjunct faculty. So we can make their lives better, um, I think, by encouraging the use of OER at all the campuses that they, one or many campuses where they do this, this uh, work that they do. You know, I think um, 
Jonathan, I was really struck by the comment that you made and, you know, that you just sort of reiterated about like, you know, who this discussion is relevant for and that it doesn't really reflect the entire um, labor pool of who's teaching courses. And I, um, I, it just made me curious because there are, you know, evaluation processes, they're not the PNT process, but um, there are guidelines and ways that part-time and adjunct faculty get evaluated or get onto um, multi-year contracts or if a line opens up, could be hired, et cetera. So it just kind of sparked that question for me. But before we go any further, will you please talk about the apron that is behind you? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, the, the, we in Colorado, we had a conference in May and um, I think it was Deb Kayak Franson and Dustin Fife who Apparently you can special order like um, Home Depot style uh, aprons with any slogan you want. And so they, for all of us who were in the organizers of this conference, they gave us our, we tried to give one to the governor of Colorado who, who introduced our conference and he like, he wouldn't even touch it. He, yeah, politicians don't like to put on silly hat, clothing because they're afraid someone might take a picture of them, but he was really disappointed, but I like it. Thank you, Amy, for asking the question on everyone's mind. Okay, so um, the, the next uh, two questions from Sherry and Stephanie Halam, I think are related and that probably uh, some folks from the Rebus team and also I would um, chime in to address, but um, Sherry's question is, is it possible to create peer review system of OER materials in which both full-time and adjuncts collaborate and review OER materials? And Stephanie, which I, I think this is a related question, are there any platforms for faculty to submit OER where materials could be peer reviewed? Um, so in the Open Textbook Library, there is a, a light peer review that happens post publication. Um, so certainly um, that is one way to get uh, feedback and review on open textbooks. And uh, would you care to speak to how the Rebus community could be involved? Yes, absolutely. Um, love this question. So we have worked with a bunch of projects, including Marx, as he's spoken to on peer review. Um, and what we have is, it's not a question of uh, materials being able to be handed over to us to then organize the peer review for, but we have a system that is replicable that anybody can pick up and use and adapt. Um, and then we also have the platform to support it where people can create a public homepage for their project so people know that this is happening and then release a CFP through our network and we have resources to advise them on where else to, to put that CFP to recruit reviewers and then hand, how to handle them once they've got them. Um, the whole process kind of start to finish. Uh, we've been, we've done, oh, it would be a couple of dozen now, I think uh, projects have gone through peer, this peer review system that we've been refining. Um, so it's not quite that idea of a, of a, of a handoff and, and the, the review happens, it is still done by the project kind of leads. Um, and then to the question of who's doing it, we've had a huge range of people respond and, and participate in that. Um, again, it's the person leading the project who decides what they need. And I think this is a really interesting conversation in, in, in that sense of, um, you know, if, if who is doing the review is going to be considered, then that can go into your thinking. Um, we also encourage people to think very broadly. So if you know that needs to be a priority because you're submitting for, um, for tenure, great. Think about how else you can have other people involved to contribute other kinds of feedback that will still make the, the project, uh, you know, make the text stronger. Um, and that includes things like classroom review uh, and, and those are the, the proofreading copy editing reviews. Those are, are super handy too for those of us who like the, the grammar tool the impact. Aparva, would you add anything to that? Great, thank you. I will add that I've also seen project leads in the Open Textbook Network organize these type of peer reviews among the community, sending out messages um, in our Google group, for example. And there are probably at least half a dozen openly licensed metrics and rubrics out there that you can use as a jumping off point. Um, and I think we can probably track down some links for that as well. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm reviewing the um, questions that we still have here. We got a question from Twitter, which is exciting. Um, this question is uh, a bit more broad and, and big picture, and is for anyone who's in this call. Do you have concerns about how publishing in non-traditional avenues might impact 
an early career librarian and researcher's career. Yes, go for it though. You've got, I think that the, you know, the, there's evidence in, um, in publishing of, you know, novels that appear on bestseller lists of the New York Times and in OA access journals is evidence that going open uh, is, has means you have more impact. You know, if you're, if you're an artist, well, I don't know, I know of two studies that say uh, commercial fiction writers who've made more money releasing their books under CC license at the same time they're com commercially published through publishers. So I think that I think that the earlier you are, the more impact you would, it only will grow longer. It's like compound interest. Get in early and you'll make, you'll have more impact over the course of your career. That would be my take on it. I think my cautious uh, stance would be yes, but pay attention to your unit culture and talk to people um, that have gone through the process or who will be involved in your process um, just in case because bad things can sometimes happen later. <laughs> and I think being able to, to really tell the story of why you've made those choices is, is important too. Um, there's a, a, I've heard it more in, in kind of um, open access uh, research uh, conversations, but there's that, you know, if you wear your open on your sleeve, if you make it part of the fabric of the doing the work, that's kind of an easier sell. No, there is no universe in which everybody can take that that big step. Um, if you can, that's one way to approach it. Or otherwise, just being able to explain very clearly, like what Jonathan was saying, that actually this is to increase my impact. This is, you know, still putting it in the language of, of what people are expecting to hear as, as you're, um, you know, preparing for tenure or, or in other ways trying to advance your career. Rick has a, an interesting question. So we're all familiar with the metrics associated with OER, like student savings, greater enrollment in courses because of that lower cost, greater retention of students in courses because they don't have to drop the course because of high textbook costs, things like that. Do any of these metrics have value in a tenure portfolio or a tenure narrative? Like my teaching saves money, increases retention, and so on. Um, or with adjunct folks trying to argue for a 10 year gig? I think it might be pretty limited in its value in terms of going up for tenure, um, but it would probably fit under the pedagogy of, of the research teaching and service. And so you should, you should definitely put it in there. Um, and it's some meat to put behind. Everybody sort of pays lip service to retention, um, but it's, it's actual, um, you know, there's like an actual sort of research-based approach to uh, keeping students is that if it's more affordable, you'll, you'll be able to retain more, you'll be able to retain more students and keep them there longer and, and under different conditions, under different challenges that they face. So that, that's, that's my, my primary guess. At my institution, I think um, for both streams, the research stream and the educational leadership stream, the angle might be different. Um, for the research stream, the angle might be um, these things or these demonstrated metrics uh, are evidence of good teaching. And then for the educational leadership stream, um, to, for tenure and promotion would absolutely need to include evidence of impact. So it wouldn't be enough to say, um, I wrote this thing, but really what was the impact that that had. Um, so I think everything in Rick's comments uh, would be fleshed out in a tenure package for somebody in the Yale stream here. Um, yeah, I'll also add that um, Virginia Clinton has just done a meta-analysis of a bunch of different ways that, um, or a bunch of different studies that measured the impacts of OER, um, relating it to course withdrawal, um, measuring it against an open, or an, a traditional textbook, and um, it's starting, that study particularly is starting to, I think, interest a lot of people in business offices, and perhaps we use that to push forward this, uh, this story. It, um, obviously there are some questions that need answering around that, like what's the, you know, how does withdrawal rates affect graduation rates? But there's certainly research that's happening around like, um, how do you respond to the KPUs that a, uh, that a business office would require? But I think both Jackie and Mark's responses had to do with that, that maybe you will you want to talk about those, the metrics and not so much I used OER because I hope to get those outcomes, but talk, you know, why, don't even mention the OER, say, well, I had greater success rate because the student, you know, 
gee, the students comment in their for their evaluations that they had the textbook from day zero. But anyway, I had a higher success rate. I do, I do think we need to be careful, which is um, if you are making the choice yourself about whether to switch to using OER in a class, you think I'm going to get suddenly that, you know, I'm always saying one third reduction in DFW rates among uh, minority and pel uh, eligible students that from that Hilton study, I think it was. And, you know, there is an enormous, here's a dirty little fact, there's an enormous amount of variation from semester to semester, instructor to instructor in these kinds of metrics, which is enormous. It's, you know, so if you, you may see a tremendous drop in your success rate the, the semester you switch to using OER, but it's not because of the OER, it's because there's an enormous amount of variation. Hang in there for another few years and the average will look good, but I, it's not a silver bullet and it's the variation is, I've been collecting data on this stuff lately and it's just amazing how much variation there is across academia and these kinds of metrics that we care the most about. A slightly different angle of this same question from Anita, who's wondering specifically about research universities and anyone who's here, your perceptions of OER and tenure and promotion at research universities and what counts. It seems that departmental PNT is very influenced by disciplinary bodies. So um, anyone at an R1 or research institution who cares to? Everything I've said applies um, since we would put ourselves in that category. But it, I think we're in a unique situation because we have this teaching focused tenure track. Tenure track. Um, so I think going back to P&T for a research faculty member, um, it would be evidence of good teaching, which is important, um, but not, it would not be placed in the scholarly activities in one's discipline, usually. We have one question remaining, and I think we have time for it. It is a bit of a departure, I think, from our um, ongoing conversation, but in the same vein of how can we all support the advancement of open education. So Deanna is wondering, she's a consultant at a state library and what role, if any, can you see state libraries playing in spreading awareness about OER and increasing adoption? And this is not just for our three guests. If there are others in the call who have thoughts, please chime in, feel free to unmute or share in chat. Deanna, do you have ideas? Do you want to bounce off of us? Hey, this is Dina. I work at the Idaho Commission for Libraries, um, which is essentially the state library in Idaho. And um, this is a kind of a new angle that we're looking at taking, and we're looking at it as a way to engage with academic librarians across the state, which is a group that we haven't always um, really made a really strong connection with. Um, and we know that there are, a, there's a lot of talk in the state about OER. Um, there have been kind of some one-off efforts here and there, but um, we're, we're wondering if the state can serve as, the state library can serve as an entity that helps kind of bring some of those conversations together um, as, you know, staff move on to other things. So having kind of a consistent group of people to shepherd this through. So I'm wondering, have you had any experiences with your state libraries? Have you heard of other state libraries that have been helping with initiatives that, um, that you thought were successful or at least uh, something to learn from? This is Amy and it sounds like Oregon might potentially have a similar kind of state library as what you have. I know different people mean different things when they say state library, but um, it's tricky because the state library in Oregon serves all types of libraries. And as you say, this does, um, you know, in this context, we're talking about academic um, libraries. Um, but one thing that we have done is um, the state library is sending a rep to our statewide OER steering committee meetings now so that we can like see what issues come up that the state library might want to be keeping an eye on or participating in. Um, and the state library also um, makes, um, you know, negotiates deals. We looked at whether it was possible to um, look at ebooks that, you know, academic monographs that could be used as 
textbooks in you know some types of courses where that's appropriate. So um, I know that Idaho has some um, Orbis Cascade Alliance libraries as well, which is another place where there's that like purchasing power angle. Um, it's not OER because it's not open, but it does sort of get at that textbook affordability issue that is um, you know a big part of OER. Thanks, Dina and Amy. And since we're at the top of the hour or the end of the hour, however you care to look at the last two minutes, um, please join me in thanking our three guests, Mark Pepsil, Jackie Stewart, and Jonathan Poritz for leading us in this um, lively conversation about tenure and promotion and OER. Um, there are some final notes in the chat. Uh, Lee wanted to say she meant KPIs earlier, not KPUs. Um, it's always easy to make those kind of acronym errors. And, and you know, KPU is just such, it's on the brain when you're talking about <laughs> it. Yeah, they're doing such great stuff. <laughs> There's a lot oh, going on in a video call too. So <laughs> thanks everyone for joining. I'll, I'll add my thanks and a reminder, we're taking December off from office hours, but you'll be hearing from us uh, very soon with our January topic. Um, you can keep an eye out on Twitter as always. We are at Rebus Community uh, and OTN is at open underscore textbooks. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. Bye.